evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where our mission is to share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy here at El Paso Community College. And my name is Jules Simon, and I teach philosophy. I'm a philosopher at the University of Texas, El Paso. Today, we feel very grateful to be here interviewing our colleagues from the Rio Grande Valley, Dr. Mariana Alessandri and Dr. Alex Stein. We've known and worked with both of them for a number of years. Alex, I believe I met you in 2008 at the SAP. We were in the same panel in Michigan. And then, so that's 14 years. And then Mariana, I met you at College Station. Um, I think I met you at lunch. I don't remember much, <laughs> but. And I met the both of you at, at a conference you hosted in South Texas in your hometown, your home university, UT Rio Grande Valley. Dr. Alexander Stein, who prefers to go by Alex, grew up in the rural South Texas town of Aransas Pass, near Corpus Christi, Christi as a monolingual English speaker of mixed white heritages, German, English, Scotch-Irish, and Ukrainian Jewish. We should talk about that sometime, because I teach yeah. Jewish philosophy, right? Uh, the child of middle-class professionals who worked all day, he was raised during after-school hours by his nana, a bilingual Mexican-American woman named Frances, who spoke only English with him and his brother and, sp and Spanish with her own children. Alex didn't begin seriously learning Spanish until his senior year at Austin College, where he became interested in Latin American liberation theology. While earning a PhD from Penn State, Dr. Stein, Stein spent the 2008 academic year in Mexico City studying La Filosofía de la Liberación Latinoamericana, Principalmente con el filósofo Argentino Mexicano Enrique Dussel en la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM. Dr. Stein currently serves as Associate Professor of Philosophy Associate Director of the Center for Bi Bilingual Studies and faculty, faculty Affiliate in Mexican American Studies at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. His research works to philosophically bridge the Americas and draws inspiration from his students. His publications include Latin American Philosophy in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Nation Building Through Education, Positivism and Its Transformations in Mexico, in Latin American and Latinx philosophy, a collaborative introduction, and teaching Gloria Anseldúa as an American philosopher, in teaching Gloria E. Anseldúa pedagogy and practice for our classrooms and communities. Along with his wife and colleague, Dr. Mariana Alessandri, he is co-founder of RGV Puede, Rio Grande Valley Parents United for Excellent Dual Language Education whose mission is to support, improve, and extend dual language programs that promote bilingualism, biliteracy, and biculturalism by providing at least 50% of instruction in Spanish from pre-K to 12th, from pre-K to 12th across the Rio Grande Valley. Dr. Mariana Alessandri is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and is an affiliate faculty in the Mexican Studies, Mexican American Studies, Religious Studies, and Gender and Women's Studies. Her writing aims to persuade people not to cast such a nasty eye on dark moods like anger, sadness, grief, depression, and anxiety. She has published in a variety of venues, including the New York Times, uh, New Philosopher, Womankind, Times Higher Ed, and the Chronicle of Higher Ed. She is the author of the upcoming book, Night Vision, Seeing Dignity in Dark Moods. Mariana and her partner live on the U.S.-Mexico border and are raising two children in Spanglish. They co-founded the soon-to-be nonprofit organization RGV Puede, which advocates for and supports dual language education in the Rio Grande Valley public schools. Her commitment to raising bilingual children comes from being a first-generation Chilean-American born, born and raised in New York City and from having spent two pre-kid years living in Me Mexico, Mexico City and Salamanca, Spain. And I really, um, I really liked your uh, some of your presentations, Mariana. So some of her presentations include, is Spanglish fail? When speaking Spanish feels like shame, 
Platicando about linguistic shame in the Rio Grande Valley, welcoming the undocumented immigrant con brazos abiertos in deep South Texas, the redemption of negative feeling, Miguel de Unamuno, Taco Tech, the healing power of borders. So very, very germane to what we're, we'll, we'll be talking, discussing today. And together with Dr. Alex Stein, um, they were the recipients of the 2020 Inter-American Philosophy Award um, by the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy uh, for La Mexicana La Chicana, the Mexican sources of Ansaldúa's Inter-American Philosophy. Also, uh, the Smithsonian Community, Smithsonian Community Grant, uh, the MetLife Foundation in 2012, they were awarded $5,000 with five other faculty to develop a community mural project, honoring farm workers in conjunction with the Smithsonian exhibit, Bittersweet Harvest, the Bracero Program, 1942 through 1962. And another thing that I thought was super awesome about Mariana, she has been volunteering um, since 2004 with Habitat for Humanity at the Rio Grande Valley as a carpenter. So you just, you don't just think about it. You roll up your sleeves and get to work. Yeah, and, and, and just before we start our questions, I just, after reading, reading your list of accomplishments already, <laughs> um, it just struck me, and I said this to Kim, that your work, both, the both of you are working so hard on the border, for the border, and for bringing philosophy in this unique way to, uh, uh, people in your community, borderlanders. It's remarkable how invested you are, you know, so thank you, thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, thank you for carving out a little time to join us <laughs> amidst all your activities. Yes, we Would should like thank our university for giving us jobs here because we wouldn't have been able to invest our lives and our philosophy in this place had we not you know, yeah. had gainful employment. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting comment because, uh, you know, similarly, we are, were working at border institutions as well, you know, and, and part of the reason why we're here and doing this is because the, the institutions are hosting us the way they do. You know, they think philosophy is important. So, um, but let's get started on the questions. So, so you saw them. What, what, what? is La Frontera? What is La Frontera? How would you, just that pretty simple question. Yeah, you included in your work profile, you're living on La Frontera. How do you think about it? Do you wanna go first or? <laughs> All right, <laughs> well, I see it like, um, well, no, I, I'm obviously like through and through inspired by Ansaldúa. So anything I have to say about La Frontera is coming from her. And I just see La Frontera as the space in between Falfurias, like where I live, Falfurias and the, and the Mexico-US border. So it's the whole space. It's not like the one thing that cuts, even though it also cuts, but it's the space where you get to be a lot of different things at once. And this is what I love about Ansaldúa's work is that as much as it hurts her to be cut, in half by the border that now has barbed wire on it. It also gives a lot of room to play, a lot of room to be different, a lot of room to mix categories. Um, because most of the time, unless there's something terrible happening here, most of the time we get left alone by the rest of the US. And I love that because we just kind of are ignored and we get to be however we want to be. We get to speak Spanglish. We get to be this, what Anseldoa calls the third country. And I just love that, the third space, which isn't, we're not like the rest of the US. That's up North, you know, that's a whole different world and we're not Mexico either. And so we're this place that encompasses both and we get to play and we get to think um, and we get to live and we get to create new identities for ourselves. And that's what I like to do with my students. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, I mean, like she said. <laughs> I think like that uh, I think that also for me, um, even when back in 2010, when I was on a plane, you know, flying here to have a job interview with the university that eventually hired me, you know, I was I was rereading Anzalua's La Frontera 
and just so excited to be going to what I knew was the undergraduate alma mater of this philosopher who I already thought was amazing, but I had never really, I mean, I had been to the, to the Rio Grande Valley once as a child um, when I was 12. Um, and, and I think that my, my impression or my understanding of borders really kind of started uh, when I was a 12 year old and I, I came here um, with a friend and that friend uh, was Mexican American and um, raised to only speak English by his parents who both were fluent Spanish speakers born in Mexico. And when we, he just invited me along as his kind of gringo friend. And so, you know, I went along and, um, you know, he couldn't communicate with so many members of his own family because he couldn't speak Spanish. And obviously many members of his family were bilingual and so they could communicate with him if they could speak English, but he was kind of cut off from his own familia. And he, you know, suffered for that. And I, I kind of couldn't even understand at the time because I had no concept of any political or philosophical reality or anything. I was just a 12 year old, but, but I could, I could see that he suffered and it puzzled me, you know, and it kind of got me thinking like, like, how could this happen that parents wouldn't teach their own child their language, you know? And, and so I didn't come back to any of that um, until, you know, much later in graduate school when I was reading Anzalua's book and I, I hadn't even remembered that I remembered that experience, you know, and I think part of the way that she writes, you know, taps into very, very deep places in our own memory in, in different ways. Uh, and so I think that, you know, for me, I, I don't have some kind of like big conceptual apparatus that uh, explains what La Frontera is, like it's some kind of platonic form. I just think of like the specific place here, you know, no La Frontera si una frontera, right? This is for me, La Frontera. And I think that, um, you know, there, there are other fronteras, ones that I don't know a lot about, ones that I'm sure are different, um, but, but probably share some commonalities. But, you know, for me, more than anything, La Frontera names a way of, of thinking and living kind of from a, from a particular place where we've like very happily rooted ourselves, even though we're not originally rooted here. So we're both you know, como transterrados, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, people who have, thankfully, the people here have mostly adopted us and, and sort of welcomed us. But um, yeah, I, I'm sure it feels different from the insider um, perspective. And so overwhelmingly for me, it's been positive. The one exception, and back to what you were saying about the pain, uh, and even the the experience I shared about my friend um, that I grew up with, Tim, and the pain that he experienced. You know, we have a student right now that we were trying to pay to do this cool philosophy as a way of life program where she would be leading peer dialogue. And, you know, we, we just found out from her that she's undocumented and that she doesn't have DACA. And we're trying to bend over backwards and try to figure out some clever way to still be able to pay her because, you know, all the students that we've invited to participate in this program, we wanted to pay. And it really just looks like we're not going to be able to as a university. And that's, it's so fundamentally unfair and unjust. Um, and, and so it's just, you know, there are always these reminders that La Frontera is that barbed wire, right? La Frontera is that the wound, La Frontera, for all its beauty and all the things that it has made possible for this community, I feel like it also, you know, really cuts people. And it it's hard to kind of think of something that's like that, that's both beautiful and sort of dangerous. The ocean. Uh, and yeah. you guys are close to the ocean, you know. Um, and I was very fortunate, I don't think I mentioned, but I worked directly with Mariana and Alex we were together working for one year at UTPA before it turned to Rio Grande Valley. And uh, so I am from El Paso, from El Paso Juarez. And it was interesting being there. And I remember telling Jules, uh, because it's so similar because it's La Frontera, right? And so um, when Mariana was sharing with us how her lay of the land of La Frontera um, it reminded me that, and it's, the geography is important, right? Because it's the South Valley of Texas, the Rio Grande Valley. And so it's its own pocket. 
it's a, it's a ways down from Houston and San Antonio. I don't I remember how many hours, but it's a good chunk of time. Seven hours, I forget. Maybe I was going real slow. <laughs> Three and a half from San Antonio, but yeah. It, it's, it's another crazy. world because like I grew up three hours north from here, you know, near Corpus Christi. And it, it's just, uh, yeah, it really is this, like you're saying, the third country. It, it, it feels like country. its own pocket, like you said. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, I, and it's like, it's great because it's, you, got, you got elotes, people speaking Spanglish, right? So it's very similar to being here in, in El Paso Juarez, um, except that it's very um, agricultural. Right, and so here it's really industrial, and so yeah, just to say about the some of the differences to Alex that you mentioned, you know, it's not La Frontera, but at least this my grasping for what my own corner of La Frontera is, right, which would be different from La Frontera in New Mexico, Arizona, right, California. So this is it's different but similar similar things and it also cuts here because um the west side of el paso and I, alex you spent some time here too the west side of el paso is the most affluent part of town but you look over and you see anabra right and you see the 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 houses that maybe have heat right now right we don't know so it's very that difference is really stark and instead of paved streets, they have dirt roads still, many of them, many of the, many of the barrios in an opera. Very, but we're so close to each other. Yeah, my office uh, was really literally a stone's throw uh, from the border, from that neighborhood. Yeah, and place really matters because our, our university now, you know, when you worked here, Kim, you worked for UTPA, which is in Edinburgh, which is now part of UTRGV. But there was also, you know, the University of Texas at Brownsville, um, and those universities merged and became the university that we are. But the campus feel, you know, on the campus where we primarily work, um, you know, it's, it's 10, 15 miles from the border, whereas the border like literally cuts across the Brownsville campus, right? I mean, the, the fence and the razor wire are, are, are right there and, and the border patrol walks the campus grounds, right? And we went there uh, during the pandemic to have just a nice date. You know, we, we bought some vegan food. We put out a little blanket on the ground. You know, we, we ate and we took a nap and we got woken up by police officers because people had reported us as, um, two illegals passed out <laughs> because you're brown <laughs> <laughs> and so you know i was just thinking like wow you know what a difference between the two campuses because when we go to the brownsville campus the first thing i see is is beauty you know i i la resacas and like there's birds and it's it feels sort of subtropical it's it's so much closer to the ocean it's gorgeous you know so that's the beauty of la frontera but then then there's the, the part that cuts you, right? Like you get woken up from your nap by a campus police officer that wants to see some ID. Deport you. Um, <laughs> right. So you just really, uh, ne you notice the difference and, and how much difference it even makes, the, the kind of proximity to the part of the border that cuts, you know? I want to talk about the next question with this because I think students on the border are very different than deeper in the U.S., right, or deeper in Mexico for that matter, right? The questions that are being asked from these two different places for me are different. How would you say, in your experience, how is working on philosophy and teaching philosophy from the border different than when you worked at Penn State, for instance, right? Uh, the question was, yeah, how are, how are they metaphysically different? Right, the reality of being in one place versus another. So when we were thinking about that question, you can either think about it as teaching kind of normal like Western philosophy canon or teaching philosophy of the border, like teaching Ansaldua. And I prefer to think of that one, like what's it like to teach Ansaldua where she came from? 
And we had both taught Ansaldua in Pennsylvania because we were graduate students at Penn State. And I had learned about Ansaldua in Washington, D.C., doing my master's. And so this woman has reach, right? Like she's not just like a local philosopher that no one knows about. Like everyone studies her in all parts of the world. So when I taught her at Penn State, it was like I was trying to give the students there a window into the world of people on the frontera. So they had this window and they could see what it was like to live and grow up as she did here with all the pain and all the beauty and, and everything. But then getting here and teaching her to our students here was like giving them a mirror. And it was so beautiful to watch the difference in their reactions. Because in Penn State, I would say, how do you like this book after the first day? And our students got so angry with Gloria for writing in Spanglish and for writing in Spanish. And they said, she's trying to exclude me. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't care about me. She wants me to feel stupid, you know? And then when I got here, I expected that. I thought they'd get angry. And I said, how did you like reading the text? And they said, I've never read anything like this. I've never read anything in my own language that's in a classroom, that's not for Spanish class. And they loved it. And even the ones who didn't understand, I, well, of course we have lots of students, like you're talking about your friend, who don't speak Spanish and who don't read Spanish. And they said, but it made me want to learn Spanish. And so they, they felt like they, they weren't angry at her at all. And teaching her at Penn State, I, I sort of thought she was doing it on purpose. Like, um, yeah, she wants to just make us a, a claim for her own language and she wants to kind of rib people a little bit. But aquí, what I came to realize is that that's just how she talks, right? It's not as much of a political move as I thought it was. I thought she was really trying to say something. And it, she just says in the book, until I can speak my language, instead of always translating for my reader, then I don't feel at home. And so in so much of what my students were picking up was like, oh, that's my language. Like this may be the very first book that they've ever read in their own language. And for that, it's beautiful to be able to give them a mirror. And it doesn't mirror everyone's experience. A lot of, you know, there's a handful of students who don't identify with her experience, but so many do. And they're just like blown away. So I like thinking of teaching philosophy from the border on the border as more of a mirror to the students who live on the border than a window. And it's about time. They don't have mirrors. They don't read books about people who look like them or who talk like them. And so it means so much more, I think, to teach it here to our students. It all takes on a, a different connotation. It's very affirming. Hmm. Yeah. It affirms their experience, their it, reality. It, it's interesting, the, the, the images you use. So, so in, in uh, Penn State, you provided a window and, and in the, uh, you know, in South Texas, you're providing a mirror. You know, this is two different ways of um, learning the, reali the, the reality of this place, right? Um, because you're, you're actually asking the students who you're teaching now to look at themselves, right? <laughs> And you know, and in, in Penn State, you're asking them in some ways to look at others, right? Right. right. You know, these others who are, uh, for me, I come from the Northeast as well, or came from the Northeast, and I'd never been to the border until I moved to the border in 94. So this was a very strange territory for me. If you're speaking metaphysically, like, um for people outside of here, you can just talk about Ansaldua and her abstract border. And you can just talk about borders in all kinds of ways. But like here, it's actually what, what it is. Like it's, there's a geographic location. This is like a very physical place in addition to being metaphorical. Like it's a whole different place. And, and when we moved here, when I came to visit actually, I was scared to come to Texas at all because I'm from New York and I didn't want guns. And so, but when I got here and I just heard mariachi and I ate food and I like walked around smelling tortillas everywhere, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I said, this isn't Texas or Mexico, this is Mexis. 
So it felt like this is teaching what it is to be on the border, on the border as a real location, as a totally real place with real experiences. So it it does hit home in a way that it doesn't that that people don't really understand if they just think of it as a an an abstract concept. Yeah. So I think that for me, thinking about it metaphysically, it's the kind of plurality of the border or la frontera or the borderlands that is already kind of lived and known and experienced by our students. Uh, whereas thinking about the Penn State students, you know, I, I tend to think of their their sort of metaphysical reality as, as much more um, singular, right? They, I don't want to overgeneralize, but um, most of those students were monolinguals and to the extent that they had one language, they kind of really only had one world, right? Um, whereas our students, they're not all bilingual, um, but most of them have some bilingualism, uh, all all kinds of varieties, right? There's a wide variety, but but there's a there's a plurality to their language, and because of that, I think there's a certain plurality to their identity, metaphysically even, and and they don't sometimes they feel torn. But sometimes they don't feel torn. Sometimes they just feel like there are two things at once, right? And I feel like um, Anzalu is not the only person who you can pull a philosophy that kind of describes what it's like to be two things uh, truthfully at once. But but she's one of the places that you can pull that from. And so I think that 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 uh, window versus mirror metaphor that you were using, you know, when when you would show Penn State students kind of the world of the valley or Anzalu's world through the window, you know, they, they already felt alienated from that reality. And to the extent that they could see there, there was this person, this philosopher Anzadua, who was kind of describing the world through her own eyes, you know, I think they felt alienated um, by her. You know, I felt, I thought, you know, to the extent that they think she's deliberately excluding them, you know, they feel judged or um, they tended to perceive her as much more angry, you know. Um, but from within the border, Right, uh, people are describing, uh, or they they experience some of those kind of describing something that they already know. And so, one of the things that I've played with in my research since we got here, and since you know we've kind of deepened our own understanding of Anzalua, is um, you know for the paper that you mentioned that won the award for SAP in 2020, you know we were really trying to look at Anzalua, you know as a, as a Mexican philosopher, right, as as participating in this kind of historical lineage of la filosofía de lo mexicano. Um, and then in, in a different piece, you know, I try to read Anzalua really in this lineage of American philosophy in North American philosophy, right? So I teach a philosophy class here that starts with Benjamin Franklin and ends with Anzalua, right? And so there's a, there's a way in which like metaphysically, I wanna say, you know, she's Mexican. I wanna say she's American. Right, and she's both those things, and she experiences a kind of conflict, but also the possibility of this kind of third country, this third identity that that manages to balance those things. And so, it's such a delight to teach her here, because you have students that that don't like her, that disagree with her, or thinks think that she misdescribes the valley. But there's a there's an openness, right, and it's you don't run into the the level of hostility uh, that I ran into, or I think you ran into as well at, at Penn State. And it's hard to give ac accounts of exactly why that is, but it's way more satisfying <laughs> teaching on Zalua here. And I feel like also our students here have taught me so much about Anzalua, or even just, you know, the first time I went into a gas station and ordered a taco and just heard people using Spanish and Spanglish and English, like, like that gas station was teaching me about La Frontera and Anzadua and you know all these things it's just like I feel like I'm walking around in a this philosophically rich place. And that leads us right into the next question right so metaphysics um, you know, in some ways we've you know we started off talking about place and spaces and using metaphors or ideas of looking through to another place or another space, right? And how one is placed and, and how that affects one's life. Um, and that brings up um, questions about, uh, well, in those places, 
is there a certain special or distinct way of knowing, you know, epistemically? Does the border like demand that we know or approach epistemology differently? You know, we're, we're taught certain ways to <laughs> teach epistemology, um, ways that we know, but does the border challenge those conventional, uh, that conventional paradigm? Um, and does it, does it teach us different ways to express knowing, knowing about each other and the world we live in? You know, um, I want to put that in my own words. The, yeah, what, what questions are raised, right? Mm. How do we question knowledge and what, well, what is in reality? But yeah, what questions are asked here that may not be asked in more mainstream? Questions, knowledge, epistemology, knowing. <laughs> In, p in places where, it, so we, we started off with the place, right? And the barbed wire and the tropical paradise versus desertified areas, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but you know, there's, that. Place, there's places that don't, <laughs> there, are, there are places that don't have or experience that kind of border phenomenon, right? And you know, living as we do, the four of us, on the border, teaching from the border. It seems like, you know, we're, we grapple with these questions or ways of knowing in different ways than people who don't have that, um, that experience, the border experience. What do you think? What I find here is that students don't know how much they know mm. because they've been taught that knowledge is something packaged, something you can memorize something coming from bodies that look very different from theirs. Mm -hmm. And so they don't see themselves as knowers or as people who are capable of even generating knowledge. And I find that all of our students have knowledge just from living here. They have a kind of knowledge that they don't even understand. Like they have a lot of trouble writing letters of interest for graduate school and they say, oh, I'm just, I'm not interesting, what do I have to offer? And so one of my missions is always to show them that they do know and that so much of what they know, the academy doesn't take seriously or their schooling hasn't taken seriously, what has been passed down to them culturally. Like how do we learn, right? That how do we learn is usually taught to us as you learn by going to a school building and you sit there and teachers tell you stuff. And uh, we're challenging all of that in philosophy to say, what about when you're at the kitchen table? What about when you're with your abuelita, when you're cooking? Like that's all knowledge. You're getting so much knowledge and you have so much knowledge that you don't even consider knowledge. So getting them to see that what they have is actually knowledge of such a rich um, quality is so much better than whatever they're memorizing or not memorizing or whatever textbooks they're buying or not buying. So that's part of the fun of teaching here is really trying to open up this category of knowledge to show them like how rich they already are. Mariana sparked this insight uh, in, in how she was don't talking forget. and presenting. Yeah, don't forget what you're gonna say, but yeah, they don't trust what they know because on the border and within Mexico, unlike in the United States, mm -hmm there's a sense for indigenous knowledge, which is like homegrown knowledge, right? That, that border dwellers still bring with them, right? Um, that kind of mix of imported colonial knowledge and then an indigenous knowledge that clashes with that and it's not valued, right? And so that's what you're talking about, kitchen table knowledge, right? <laughs> that kind of stuff that I learned from my ab abuela or my abuelo. Um, and so those are valuable sorts of, of epistemic experiences, which, um, you know, we find our students are surprised to realize that they're very valuable experiences, right? So I just want to do, just wedge in there with the indigenism <laughs> um, idea. Go ahead, Alex. 
next. Yeah, no, I was going to just echo that, but sort of from the reverse or the, I guess not the opposite, but the, you know, if you think of uh, the pair of student and teacher, right, I think you were describing pretty accurately um, what we see over and over again in our students. Um, and, you know, I, I wish all faculty um, saw our students as, as knowers and as skillful knowers and that they could recognize the knowledge that they bring with them. Um, but I was just going to say that it's, it's not only students who fail to recognize that they have that knowledge, right? It's often faculty. Um, there is sadly a whole group of faculty who, you know, even though they've been hired to teach at a border Hispanic serving institution um, that we think is absolutely flowing with student knowledge, you know, they, they're convinced that they have been consigned to some intellectual backwater where the students are not as well groomed, prepared, educated as the place where they came from, wherever that is, right? And so they define our students in terms of what our students lack and they uh, minimize that knowledge and fail to recognize it. And then oftentimes, because the students aren't seen as knowers, they don't perform as knowers, and then that just becomes a kind of nasty self-fulfilling prophecy. And those faculty tend to be, I don't think, very successful and usually unhappy. Uh, and their students tend to not be successful in those classes and therefore unhappy. And, and conversely, you know, the, the faculty who are able to begin with the assumption that our students have knowledge, and then it's, it's a question of, well, what, what knowledge do they already have, and how can I use that knowledge as a foundation for helping them grow in whatever direction my class is, you know, designed to help them grow, right? Um, so it's, it's remarkable how much both our students sometimes don't realize they know, but also how much our faculty sometimes think they don't know. And then conversely, you know, again, I, I don't want to overly stereotype, but I met quite a number of Penn State students who I thought their problem was really that they thought they knew much more than they in fact knew, <laughs> right? Uh, and so um, at, at Penn State, I often felt like I was trying to um, teach or inculcate sort of a mental humility. Um, and here, I usually feel like most of my job is actually the opposite, is, is trying to inculcate a kind of um, intellectual daring or pride um, in, in sort of helping students feel like they're much more knowledgeable, even than other people have led them to believe. You know? And of course, it's different from every student. And you know, there were intellectually humble students at Penn State. And there are, you know, students who are very full of themselves here. But but you see the patterns, right? Yeah, no, and, okay. and you have to give, I think, some kind of social and political and historical account of why, why those patterns, right? Um, and I think that, yeah, for centuries, um, the students here who we teach just, you know, they and their families before them have, have unfortunately been defined as, um, yeah, sort of epistemically deficient, vacuous. <laughs> deficient, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Linguistically deficient. Oh yeah. Intellectually yeah. deficient. Ontologically deficient. <laughs> yes, and it's it's so remarkable because those very same people, right? Um, we tend to experience as like the best students we've ever had, right? The most remarkable knowing astonishing students we've ever had. And it, it's so remarkable because, you know, we're talking about the same students and yet they're experienced in, in such radically different ways based, I think, on a certain set of assumptions about things like epistemology, uh, even though, you know, normally we wouldn't put it in such kind of highfalutin philosophical terms. Yeah, the, uh, the edges, right? The perimeter is not the core. Right, so La Frontera is deficient because it's on the border of not being as opposed to the core of what is, right? Um, I wanna say also my experience growing up here on the border, I think, I don't think that we're deficient. I mean, yeah, for sure, you know, like obviously, 
the main land thinks the border is deficient because it's not the core. But I think that's where the questions really happen, you know, because precisely because we're always, um, here's this one way of being and here's this other way of being and we're in the middle. And so I think it generates a lot of questions. It's a great opportunity for people to, who are so inclined to have fun raising all these questions because you have these two realities claiming that they're right, that they are the holders of knowledge. And so you're in the middle thinking, okay, <laughs> um, why? As opposed to if you're in the core, you look everywhere you look. I think like Alex was saying, you know, so if all of us, most of us are monolingual, it's one reality. So there's less opportunity for us to scratch our head about what is real and what is true. Um, so that, that leads us to the next question about logic. And also same thing, you know, I guess a way for me to, the question is, you know, how is the logic different on the border than in the mainland? On one hand, it's universal. However, it's different here. And I wanna point to Alex's um, explanation of the fluidity, right? Of how Ansaldua can be one thing and another and not be in contradiction but hold them both which in most logic systems that's not going to work <laughs> so how right what do you think about that we've been talking so much about like in the intelligence about a kind of uh, still like book knowledge right like whether they have people on the border as much like book intelligence and and that they have so much other intelligence, but we're not even yet talking about like emotional intelligence, the kind that you get from being on the border and like living here and being, if not bilingual, then certainly bicultural and um, biliterate, like just really in the way of being able to read your culture, read wherever you go. Like, am I in a doctor's office? I'm gonna speak English and translate for my grandmother. Am I at home? I'm gonna speak Spanish with my father, but then I'm gonna speak English with my niece. Like. There's so much that's gained just from living that is an emotional intelligence that they possess without knowing it again, because they just assume that everyone's as fluid. And maybe here, a lot of people are, right? Like among our own students, like a lot of them do have these skills and talents, but they don't realize that they're skills and talents because they don't know that there's people out there in the world who just have one way of operating and they wouldn't know what to do. When they get to something that they don't understand, they just say, well, that should be in English or something, right? They, they don't have that fluidity. And so the logic, like what you're saying, I think that the borderland is so much more of a both end than this either or. And that just produces knowers of a different kind and a logic of a different kind. It's the kind that Ansaldo was going for with the third space and just loosening up on the rules of how it has to be because we can start to see things from this space that it's harder to see from a space of either or. So it's it's beyond just kind of book intelligence to this emotional intelligence. Yeah, and I think the exciting thing is that, um, you know, using books and, and other forms of book intelligence in a classroom setting, you can draw upon the students kind of living logic of that both and reality that they navigate so fluently and so seamlessly. Um, and, and get them to begin, you know, to kind of understand better why certain spaces operate in a much more uh, narrow kind of exclusionary logic, right? Like even just getting them to ask the question, like why, why aren't more of your classes bilingual? Why aren't more classes in Spanish? Um, you know, why, why is it that, you know, 70 to 80% of kids who start pre-K in the Valley walk in speaking Spanish and the goal of most programs is to convert them into monolingual English learners. Why? You know, and, and like students all know that reality. Most of them have lived and usually suffered that reality. But, you know, from a philosophy class, you get to ask, well, why? Right? What's, what's the kind of logic driving that decision, right? And so, 
I think that helping um, them just uncover more of the kind of history of how those exclusionary logics are produced, right? Um, how even that sense that, like you were saying, Kim, that you know we're not on, we're not in the core, we're we're off in the periphery, we don't count, we don't matter, right? How how did those borders come to be, right? How did we go in the valley? You know, now we are on the periphery of the United States and the northern periphery of Mexico. But if you go back, uh, you know, 150 years, you're right in the heart of Mexico, right in the middle, because it, it goes so much further north, right before uh, the Treaty of 1848. So, so you can just start to play with these histories and these maps and these times, and and because the students already live in this way where they can kind of contain multitudes you know you can they can they can read books that help them understand how those exclusionary spaces were produced right by by what system by what history by which people in power right and they begin i think to be able to interrogate it and that's that's exciting right because i'm not really giving them I don't have any knowledge to offer them in terms of their living knowledge. Uh, I feel like they exceed whatever I have in terms of living knowledge, right? But I can I can help them sort of bridge the world between that living knowledge that they have and and a world of book knowledge that I immerse myself in and then sort of artificially try to become, you know, conversant with a philosophical tradition that you know, even originates in a language that is not my native language or my lang language by heritage or by birthright or by blood or by any of the ways people usually stake a claim to knowledge, right? And so I'm able to show my students that kind of flexibility, but kind of in reverse, right? Like here I am a person who can't make any blood claims to this knowledge. I didn't live it as a child, but through books, you know, I, I was able to understand things that I didn't ever experience, right? And and so that fluidity, I feel like, um, just serves students so well. But they also gain, I think, from that that book knowledge. But but you have to you have to make it where those two things aren't in such. It's not that they're not in tension because they are in tension. But but you have to show them that they could actually skillfully navigate that tension. We don't have much time left, believe it or not. To when time flies when we're having a good time. And so I just want to make an observation, but then ask you to um, kind of pick and choose how you want to respond to the rest of the questions. But um, I really like what Mariana said about uh, uh, the fluidity, this element of fluidity, uh, kind of a, 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 a different kind of logic of fluidity that takes place on the borders having to change language frames of reference and learning how to read signs differently. And so if you're bilingual, because this is you know, part of both of your lives and ours too, right? If you're bilingual, that comes to you more easily than a monolingual person you know, coming into a foreign environment. You know, the bilingual person has more resources to draw upon to learn to navigate those environments. So I try to remind my students of that all the time. You know, that this, they have this gift of bilinguality and, and why shove it down? <laughs> you know, embrace it and um, go with that. But we had a lot of other questions to ask, as you know. I would like to ask you what question you would like yeah. us to ask you. Um, and if you want to ask us also something. I mean, there's one as, as this ethics, aesthetics, so what would you like to do in terms of, is there a, a special question? Yeah, we talked about the ethical and the sociopolitical and we had really opposite answers. And so I think that would be fun to talk about because when I think about my ethical responsibility or like what, what is different ethically for me here as a teacher, I think that my job is to help them um, convert that knowledge into book knowledge to show that they are knowers and that they can actually publish their work. Because I want philosophy to change the way it looks. I want people who look like me to look like philosophers. Like I want us to just rehaul philosophy and what we think a philosopher looks like. And so for me, it feels like an ethical responsibility to teach the students ways to write philosophy that actually like 
you know, um, get across their ideas and help them know that they know something and know how to get it down and then get it published. So for me, that feels like an ethical responsibility, but you were saying it feels like a socio-political responsibility. Yeah, and I, I only put it together just now. We had a kind of pre-version of this conversation amongst just the two of us, uh, you know, last week while we were driving. Um, and I think I just put it together now that that I experienced the same thing, but I would label it a socio-political responsibility, right? I feel like my ethical responsibility is to teach students the kinds of things that will just help them get into graduate school or um, get the job interview or or like advance, you know, in in very, to me, they're kind of intellectually boring, but they're very important in terms of their own um, economic advancement, their ability to provide for themselves and their families, like very real, very material needs, right? So I feel a, an ethical responsibility to make sure that even as I'm encouraging them to write their essays in Spanglish, even as I'm encouraging them to push all the boundaries, right, that I also want them to be able to operate very skillfully in a in an English monolingual frame, or for some of them in a Spanish monolingual frame. Like I want them to have those skills, and I feel an ethical responsibility to teach them, you know, just grammatical rules and things like that, right? Um, but the socio-political responsibility for me is to um, you know encourage them to write in Spanglish or to um, you know read texts uh, in Spanish or to kind of push the boundaries. And what I put together that I hadn't put together the last time we were talking about this is that I think it's because it's ethics for you because you're like the students with the mirror, right? And it's it's socio political for me because I'm the guy looking through the window, right? So when I see my students, I see students who are um, amazing, but I don't 100% resonate with who they are and the way they grew up because I don't really share their story. There are some points of contact, right? And there, there are ways in which we're remarkably alike. But, but I still think fundamentally, you know, when I look around in the valley, I feel like I am not from here. <laughs> I am not a native borderland dweller. I am not a native Spanish speaker or even a, an organic bilingual, right? Um, whereas I think for you, it's it's close enough, even though, you know, you're not from this border. In a weird way, you were from this other border based on the, the kind of borders that your parents crossed when they moved from Chile to Nueva York. Right. So it's just interesting, like how our categories like they, they point in the same direction. But it was so interesting because you were like, no, it's it's an ethical responsibility. And I'm like, no, I, I would call that a socio-political responsibility. Either way, we feel responsible. Like, I feel like now I got my Ph.D. so that I could help open doors for other people who look like me. Like it feels very political and very ethical. Like that's why I got to do this. And mostly from being light skinned from coming from a middle class background, like I got to go to college, like I got all of these things so that now I can help in any way that I can to navigate that same system that is really hard to figure out. It's a puzzle, right? It's completely mysterious, but I can help them figure it out by kind of teaching them all the inside tricks. And I wanna give them a leg up, like I'm really into teaching writing because I'm like, this is the way you not only reclaim your tongue, but this is the way you also articulate yourself. Like you get to say, and you get to be like a, an authority and you get to like teach people what to think. So it's just so powerful to me. And I feel that, yeah, as both, I guess, a political and an ethical responsibility. The, the good thing about the border is the both and, and not just one or the other. The either or. Right, both of us can be right. And there's room for that. And so we really want to thank you both so much for joining us today and having this awesome conversation. Um, we could keep talking, but thank you. Thank you, Jules. Thank you to our production team. And thank you, too, for joining us today. Uh, we are Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. Please join us next time.